Hi, I'm Oliver, and I'll be talking about getting small proofs from congruence closure. So imagine you have some really great solver, and your solver is really great because you can give it some problems, like is a plus b equal to b plus a, and your solver will give you solutions. In this case, yes, a plus b is equal to b plus a. However, you might run into a problem. Your solver is really complicated because it can do so many things and you might not be able to trust the solution that I gave you to this problem. Luckily, modern solvers also produce proofs, which are like a step-by-step -step instruction set that you can follow to see how the solver was able to get to the solution it got. And so in this case, the solver might say, I was able to say yes because a plus b is equal to b plus a by commutativity. We can take this proof and then run it through a simple proof checker which will say whether the proof is valid or not. And because the proof checker is simple, we may trust it when it says the proof is valid, and therefore trust the solution to our original problem. And so in this way, we're able to trust the solver a lot more when the proof checker says the proof is right. Proofs are useful for a variety of reasons. We just saw that in checking, proofs allow us to trust the solver for a particular result. Proofs are also useful in debugging. Imagine our complicated solver has a bug that allows it to somehow prove that 0 is equal to 1. The proof would give us a step-by-step -step list of all the actions it took to prove that 0 is equal to 1, and we may be able to narrow down on our bug using that proof. Proofs are also useful in solvers for CDCL. A proof gives us a way to specify which particular facts led to a result so we can backtrack on those facts. Proofs are also useful in more applications, such as fuzzing and optimization. However, as soon as you start using proofs, you'll run into the problem that proofs can be long. In checking, this is not such a big problem because our proof checker is fast. But in debugging, long proofs are too confusing to be used effectively. In CDCL, proofs are too long and too specific to be able to be backtracked on effectively. And in other applications, proofs slow down the entire pipeline because you may be doing some hard computation on them. In this talk, I'll be talking about getting smaller proofs, and in particular, getting smaller proofs from congruence closure. So why congruence closure in particular? Well, congruence closure forms the basis of many solvers. It's a critical piece of the solver because all proofs of equality go through congruence closure. It's the main way that solvers talk about what things are equal to what. Our favorite application of congruence closure is equality saturation. And this is a technique for optimization and synthesis of programs. At the University of Washington, we work on a library called EGG, which allows you to perform equality saturation across a variety of domains. We use it in a few research projects in order to optimize programs and synthesize all sorts of interesting things. So that's congruence closure, and why you might want to get smaller proofs from it. So now that we've done a little bit of motivation, I'll go over what congruence closure is and how it works. Then I'll talk about how you get proofs from congruence closure. And finally, finding small proofs from congruence closure, which is our ultimate goal. In the end, I'll show that our algorithm is able to find 27% smaller proofs than the state of the art. All right, so what is congruence closure? Well, I said earlier that solvers use it to decide what things are equal to what. In particular, it's an algorithm that takes equalities between terms like a equals b, b equals c, and f of a equals f of b, and it outputs an equivalence relation on these terms stored in an e-graph data structure. And so once we have this e-graph data structure, we can now ask questions like, is a equal to c? And it'll say yes in this case. Importantly, this relation is also closed under what's called congruence. That's the property that for all x and y, if x equals y, f of x is also equal to f of y in the relation. People also call this closed under substitution because you can substitute y in for x and f of x will be equal to f of y. Now that I've described what congruence closure is, I'll go over an example so we can start building intuition. An e-graph is a graph with three kinds of edges. And I'll show you these edges in just a second. Imagine we have inputs f of a, f of b, and a single equality between a and b. We'll start by building our e-graph, 
with f of a and f of b. I'll make a node for f, which will stand for f of a, and I'll make a node for a, and I'll connect them with this directed arrow right here. And I'll also add in f of b to the e graph. This edge is a parent-child edge because it describes the parent-child relationship between f and b. Now let's add our single equality, and we'll do that by adding an equality edge shown in the dotted line between a and b. Finally, the third kind of edge is from congruence. The e graph will automatically figure out that f of a is equal to f of b and add another equality edge, this time from congruence. Let's do a slightly bigger e graph example now. This time, I'll have three terms in the e graph f of a, f of b, and f of c. First, we'll add an equality, f of a equals f of b. Now we'll do a equals b and b equals c. At this point, the e graph needs to maintain that congruence invariant just like before, so it discovers that f of b is equal to f of c. Finally, we have this extra equality, a equals c. But if you look closely, a is already equal to c in this e graph because a and c are connected by two dotted lines. So for the equality relation this e-graph represents, the a equals c edge is unnecessary, and we don't add it to the e-graph. So this e-graph represents a bunch of terms that are equal. And so what we want to get out of this example is that these equality edges form equivalence classes of terms. There are three terms on the top, f of a, f of b, and f of c, which are equal, and three terms on the bottom, a, b, and c, which are equal. So now we have our nice little example, but in practice, egress tend to look like this. This is a screenshot of a, a real egress from one of Egg's smaller tests, and it's already impossible to understand. But luckily, our next section is going to untangle this egress for us by getting proofs from congruence closure. So let's talk about that. Proofs from congruence closure answer the question, how did these two terms come to be equal? Let's try and get a proof that a is equal to c. And we'll do it in the same way that we described why a and c are equal on the previous slide. They're connected by two dotted lines, the one from a equals b and the one from b equals c. And by transitivity of equality, this proof is now valid. We've proved that a and c are equal. Let's do a slightly harder one. We'll prove that f of a is equal to f of c. We'll start in the same way. We'll use the f of a equals f of b edge. But now we get to a congruence edge, which the e graph automatically inferred before. When we get to the congruence edge, it adds a new proof burden. In particular, we need to prove that b and c are equal. And we do that using the b equals c edge. Here's an animation of what that proof looks like. We take the f of a to f of b edge, and then we do the congruence subproof between f of b and f of c by following the child pointers down. Let's take a closer look at the proof from the last slide. How would we evaluate whether this is a good proof or not? Well, one way to evaluate it would be that it's a valid proof, so it's good. It did what we wanted it to accomplish. But if you remember, this talk is about getting smaller proofs for the reasons we described at the beginning. And so, to get a smaller proof, we're going to need a notion of proof size. And for a lot of those applications, it turns out the best metric for proof size is the number of unique equalities in the proof. These unique equalities describe how much information we really needed to prove that two things were equal. In this case, we used two equalities to prove that f of a and f of c are equal. But it turns out we can do better for this example, and I'll show you how on the next slide. So here we go. We're back on our example, and we're proving that f of a and f of c are equal. If you recall, we had this a equals c edge, which I said was unnecessary because the relation already captured that a is equal to c. Well, it turns out when you're getting proofs, these unnecessary edges might be useful, and that's one of the insights of this work. So we're going to add this extra edge, a equals c, into our e graph, like this. We're also going to have the egraph algorithm infer from this a equals c edge a new congruence edge, that f of a is equal to f of c from congruence between a and c. 
And so now, when we go to get our proof out, we can use this new congruence edge, and then we need to prove that A equals C because of the congruence edge, and then we're done. We only had to use one edge between A equals C, and we got a much simpler proof out. Here's that proof in an animation form. So the key idea was that we're going to take some alternate path through the e-graph using these extra edges. But now we get to the crux of the problem. How do we choose which path through an e-graph to get a proof from? Well, here's some complicated e-graph. And I'm going to make two paths through the e-graph between A and E. One path involves four edges, A, B, C, D to E. The other path involves two normal equality edges and two congruence edges. So the question is, which of these paths results in a smaller proof? The bottom path clearly has size 4 because it involves four dotted lines. But what is the size of this top path? Well, it uses two normal equality edges, but it also uses these two congruence edges. The first congruence edge implies a subproof between C and D, and the second congruence edge implies a subproof between D and C. It turns out these both use the same edge, and in our definition of proof size, we only cared about the number of unique equalities used. So therefore, this top path only has a size of 3, because two of the congruence proofs reused the same edge. That means that it's better to take the top proof rather than the bottom one. I call this the concept that proof reuse is free. We can reuse sections of the proof from another congruence edge, and it won't incur any extra cost in the resulting proof. Another factor that makes it hard to find the smallest proof is that subproofs can be arbitrarily complex. These congruence proofs can be between anywhere in the e-graph. Finally, there can be exponential paths in a graph. And these three factors combine to make the problem of finding the optimal sized proof NP-hard. But don't despair, because we can still find smaller proofs, and that's how, what I'll show in this next section. Going back to our example, we somehow had this idea that we're going to find some shortest path through this e-graph. And intuitively, we'd like to run a shortest path algorithm through this e-graph to figure out some smaller proof. But the problem is, we don't know how big the proofs are for congruence edges before we run this shortest path algorithm. And there's an exponential number of possible proofs that we would need to explore before knowing this. And so our idea is to estimate the size of these congruence proofs before we run that shortest path algorithm in order to try and find a smaller proof. So here's a final example that shows how we're going to do this. Let's add an equality a equals b into this e-graph, which will imply a congruence between g of a and g of b. We'll also add an equality g of b equals c, which will apply another congruence between these top nodes. And the key idea is that we're going to compute estimates for these congruence nodes in a bottom-up fashion, so we can use them to find a shorter proof. Each non-congruence edge gets a weight of 1, which will enable us to find us the size of this congruence edge right here. And we'll do that by simply summing up the edges along the path needed to prove a equals b, which is 1, a single equality edge. Now that we've calculated that congruence edge, we can do the overall one, which has a path of 2 between the g of a node and the c node. This path between f of g of a and f of c, we now know to have a size of 2. And so in some larger context, we may be able to find that this is a much smaller proof than we otherwise could have. So putting it all together, we first compute the size estimates for all of these edges. Then we find a shortest path through the graph and output that extracted proof. Using this algorithm, we were able to beat the state of the art in proof extraction from congruence closure. This graph will show a cumulative number of benchmarks for a particular size of proof certificate. We have three lines here. The green line is our greedy algorithm, which I showed on the last slide, for getting proofs out of eGraphs. The blue line is Z3's brute force algorithm for trying to shrink proof size. 
and the gray line is an unoptimized proof size if you didn't try to find a smaller proof at all. Up and to the left is better because a greater number of benchmarks had a smaller proof size, and you can see that we beat both Z3 and unoptimized. We also did a case study with Intel, who is using EGG to perform multi-operation circuit optimization. So these are circuits which perform multiple operations and give multiple results for a fixed number of inputs. At Intel, it's very important that the resulting circuits are correct, so they have a very intense verification process on these resulting proofs from EGG. Using EGG's greedy proof reduction algorithm, we were able to reduce this verification time from 4.7 hours to 2.3 hours. Here's an example circuit they optimized using EGG. You can see it has two inputs on the left, A and B. It performs a bunch of shifts in arithmetic in the middle. And then it produces five outputs, which might be convenient for some particular application. I'd like to thank the rest of the team for helping me with this work. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact me at my email below. Thank you.